Okay, the format of our evening is uh, we have five speakers. They will each be talking or presenting for a few minutes. Um, it's going to be a fantastic, slightly raucous, um, multi-genre presentation. Then we will be in conversation here for a few minutes, and then afterwards uh, we hope there will be a conversation uh, with all of you. So, in order of appearance, Julie Seltzer moved to the Bay Area from the Isabella Friedman Jewish Retreat Center in Connecticut, where she was the baker. She began formal study of the scribal arts about a year and a half ago with her teacher, Jen Taylor Friedman, and has since traveled twice to Israel to learn with scribes there. She has also worked in Torah restoration and is part of the Women's Torah Project, a Torah being written collectively by women across the world. David Henkin is professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley, where he teaches about 19th century America. He is the author of City Reading, Written Words in Public Spaces in Antebellum, New York, and The Postal Age, The Emergence of Modern Communications in 19th Century America. David has taught and, when appropriate, chanted traditional Jewish texts in the Bay Area for the past 20 years. Most recently, he is co-founder of the Mission Minion in San Francisco. Sarah Lefton, founder and executive producer of Godcast, is an innovative entrepreneur who has produced events, marketing materials, and websites for, among other places, Camp Tawanga, the San Francisco Bureau of Jewish Education, the Mission Minion, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in New York, and the West End Synagogue in New York. Her writing has been featured in the New York Times, and San Francisco Chronicle, and Zeke, among other places. And she is on the board of the Jewish Community Center of San Francisco. She has a master's in interactive telecommunications from NYU and is a member of the 2009 Upstart Bay Area cohort. We also have with us from New York, Matthew Roth, who is the educational director of Godcast, who is a poet and author of Nevermind the Goldbergs, an ALA popular paperback and New York Public Library best book of the year, as well as a memoir, Yom Kippur a Go-Go, and the young adult novels, Losers and Candy in Action. These are great titles. I would get them just for the titles. Matthew has performed at such diverse events as HBO's Russell Simmons Presents Deaf Poetry, the National Queer Arts Festival, and Chabad San Francisco Menorah Lighting. He is associate editor for MyJewishLearning.com and contributes regularly to both JewSchool.com and his own site, Matthew.com. Ilana Jagoda is a cantorial soloist, music educator, music educator, performer, and composer who brings soul and innovation to Jewish music. She adds new dimensions to this musical genre by blending her energetic folk rock vibe with her passion for world music. Ilana released her first solo album, Zoom Gali Gali, last year, which was selected as one of seven CDs to be distributed nationally to families with young children through the PJ Library program. Finally, she plays rocking family concerts with her Zoom Gali band at synagogues, JCCs, and Jewish festivals, and she currently serves as a full-time cantorial soloist at Peninsula Temple Beth El in San Mateo. So first, please welcome Julie Seltzer. First, I want to thank, I want to reiterate Connie's, all of Connie's thanks and add her to the list and specifically all of the museum staff that's really welcomed me personally and has done so much work to get this exhibit in order. So you know who you are. Many, many thanks to all of you. Um, the second thing is I want to honor the memory of my mother with these words tonight. Uh, it would have been her 60th birthday today. She died a year and a half ago. Um, her name's Chaya Bat Pinchas Vibatsheva, and I'd like to um, honor her with these words of Torah. I hope I don't disappoint that I'm not going to be talking so much about Torah in the meta sense, but try and offer some thoughts uh, that come through Torah. So this weekend is Simchat Torah, the joy of Torah, the celebration of Torah. And it's a time when we read the very end of the Torah and then immediately continue and read the beginning. 
And the end, I'd like to offer some words about the last Parsha, which is called Vezota Bracha, and this is the blessing. It begins, and this is the blessing with which Moshe, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And Moshe said, God came from Sinai and rose from Seir unto them. God shined forth from Mount Paran and came from the myriads holy. At God's right hand was a fiery law unto them. The end of the second verse has a very mysterious word in it. This word is eshdat, and it's a word that appears only once in the entire Torah. It's also an interesting word because it's what's called a creek tiv, which means that the word is written in one way, but it's read in another way. It's written as one word, one single word, eshdat, but it's read as two words, esh, dat, often translated as fiery law. The Midrash talks about this fiery law as Torah, black fire on white fire. And on one level, at least, this represents the black letters of Torah on the white parchment, which parchment isn't always exactly totally white. It's sometimes spotted, depending on the animal that it came from. But that's another story. The eshdat, the fiery letters. The medieval commentator Ramban talks about this black fire of the letters and of Moshe as a scribe. And when Moshe received the Torah on Mount Sinai, what did he do? He did as all good scribes must do. He copied the Torah from an already written Torah. And this is one of the rules. I can't write anything from memory. I have to have the Torah text right there and copy from it. So Moshe, like a good scribe, was copying. The question is, what was he copying from? Wasn't this the original? Wasn't this revelation? What, what, Torah, what Torah was there? Wasn't this the first Torah? And Ramban says, no. There was an original original before the original. And this the original this primordial Torah that Moshe copied from had one difference from the one that we see today. And this difference, Ramban explained, is that the original Torah was one long stream of letters. Now, if you look inside a Torah, it actually looks a lot like one long stream of letters. It doesn't have any vowels, it doesn't have any trope signs, it doesn't have any markings for where verses end. And if it did, it wouldn't be valid for use. But there is one break that we do have, and this is the break between words. The primordial Torah did not have this break. Ramban says that the breaks that we have today were given orally as an oral tradition in order that we receive the Torah as some kind of comprehensible document with laws. However, there was another way to break it down. And this other way of breaking the letters apart, dividing the letters, revealed divine names, names of God. And I think that we can extrapolate from this that there's also an infinite number of ways that we could theoretically divide the letters and who knows what's inside of this Torah. And this is what Eshdat is about. Is it Eshdat or is it Eshdat? And it's both. And the fact that this, that, it, that it's a creative, that it's differently written from red, is hinting to us because the, the very word is talking about the fiery letters and, and the Torah. Um, it's hinting to us ab about many, many possible permutations. And I'll just offer a, an example, a timely example, which is that I'll be starting to write a Torah on Monday, which I'm really excited about. And I'm starting with the second panel, not the very beginning, modeling what ha exactly what happens on Simchat Torah, which, God willing, when I'll write the last panel, I'll immediately start from the beginning and write the first panel. And 
if the original Torah was one long stream of letters, of course, then it follows there wasn't even a break between the last letter and the first letter, it being a circular Torah. So in my preparations this week, I open up to see where do, what are the first words on this second panel? I'm so curious. What, what is this Torah going to start with? And I open it up, and I was expecting um, Metusha El Beget, um, Mechuyael and Mechuyael beget Lemech, and I don't think I got that in the right order, but I see the words that begin this second panel, and they're in Hebrew, Vehuyim Sholbach, and he will rule over you. <laughs> the context is the Garden of Eden. God curses both Adam and Eve for eating from the forbidden fruit, and Eve's curse reads as follows. To the woman, God said, I shall surely increase your sorrow and your pregnancy. In pain you will bear children, and towards your man will be your desire, and he will rule over you. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> this is a funny place for a female scribe to start a Torah. <laughs> but I was also excited because in my experience, I've found that it's the parts that are the most challenging that often have all of these uh, hidden meanings in them. So if we go back to Ramban's idea of the long stream of letters, I thought, well, maybe we could break this down differently. What happens if the spaces were in different places? And sure enough, I broke it down differently. And I'm not totally sure about the grammar on this, but I broke it down to v'huya mesh libech, and he touches your heart. So now instead of it saying, and he will rule over you, it's he touches your heart. And so when I start the Torah on Monday, even though I'll write this line with the spacing that's there, the correct spacing, I'll also have this other meaning in mind and know that there are so many, so many levels of understanding this one Torah text. Um. Thank you, Julie. As uh, David Henkin is coming up, um, there are seats in the front, so please come and sit if you'd like. Hello. Um, so I think that my primary relationship to this uh, to this exhibit uh, is that I'm someone who likes to chant the Torah. Um, but I see no Torah here, so uh, I think I'm expected to instead to speak uh, um, to speak about the Torah, and so this is what I have to say. Um, I think one of the things that we often mean when we describe Jews or when Jews describe themselves uh, as people of the book uh, is that Jews have some special relationship to their Torah, their single sacred text, that they study it day and night, uh, that they pour over it uh, in, in study halls, and it's the center of their existence. Um, I think that there are at least two, two ways in which that's uh, profoundly misleading, so I wanted to, to, to specify them. One is that it's actually not the case uh, that um, studying the Torah is or has always been at the center of, of, of Jewish life in a straightforward way. I don't just mean that there was a time when Judaism was a temple religion uh, and not a textual religion. I don't only mean that perhaps in the contemporary world the Torah has lost its uh, position of centrality in Jewish self-perception. I mean, there actually have been lots of times and places where actually reading what is in the Torah has not been central to many Jewish cultures. Uh, you can think, if you want, of, of uh, uh, Jewish societies in which large segments of the population uh, don't read the Torah, but only read various kinds of anthologies or translations. Or you can think of ultra-Orthodox communities, the yeshiva world, where uh, Torah study rarely actually involves intensive study of, uh, of the Torah Shabbat Tav, of, the, of, of, of Scripture, uh, or it's taught only to, to, to children and then uh, passed uh, along uh, in favor of things like, like, like the Talmud. Uh, so that's one thing I, I wanted to, to point out. The other uh, is uh, that the image of Torah reading as a, as a private act 
Um, is, is in some ways a, 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 a misleading uh, uh, image with which we might approach the Torah exhibit. Uh, uh, Torah, Torah study uh, as private reading is one thing, um, but the Torah reading that we are uh, interrogating and celebrating in this exhibit is something quite different. Uh, Torah reading, to the extent that it has been a big part of Jewish life, uh, has actually traditionally been something vocal, public, and collective. Uh, the Torah reading as a liturgical act, as something one does in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a ceremony, is an act of proclamation. The Hebrew word for to read, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, is the word to call. It's a speech act. It's not a cognitive act. It's not something one does uh, silently or privately. As some of the rest of you may know, the word read in English, for that matter, is also in its origin uh, from Old English, uh, a word that means to pronounce and, 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 and to call. Uh, so what, is this, what does this do to our uh, understanding of the act of, 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 of Torah reading uh, and, and Torah writing? Um, well, two things. First of all, the, the ritual of reading the Torah uh, is, in fact, the one point where intensive study and uh, uh, meticulous attention to details of, of, of a text uh, does become central to Jewish life. It's, it becomes central uh, in synagogue worship or through a bar or, 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 or bat mitzvah. Uh, and it is, uh, in its origin, an act of assembly. The original... Uh, the original Torah reading, as envisioned within the Bible itself, in, in Deuteronomy, uh, what's often called the mitzvah of hakel, uh, is a ritual of gathering. It's an act of assembly. It's not an act of, 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 of private study. And it's that that our own Torah reading uh, rituals uh, uh, um, mimic and replicate. Instituted formally, as some of you probably know, in uh, this is at least a traditional story, in the second temple period, a uh, Torah reading uh, was something that one person did in the presence of many, communal acts. And that's really what, 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 what we have here. Uh, and it's interesting because I think that, that uh, uh, it not only flies in the face of some of our ideas about why it is that people would care about a book. Right? It's very, most of us, our feelings about ourselves as book readers or interpreters, uh, uh, most of us do tend to focus on private, introspective, intellectual encounters with a text. And this really is something quite different. Ironically, uh, the part of the process that is ordinarily private is the writing of the Torah and not the reading of the Torah. I say ordinarily because one of the fascinating things about this exhibit uh, is it is publicizing uh, the ordinarily private dimension of, uh, of Torah reading, which again isn't the reading, but precisely the, 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 the writing. So the, the, the reading is, is, is always public, and it's, and it, it, it's always vocal, it is always, uh, it is always social. Uh, so one thing I, that maybe we'll get a chance to talk about or think about is the relationship between the private and, and the public uh, in the sort of constellation of rituals that surround the practice of reading and, and writing a Torah in, in traditional Jewish, Jewish life. But the other thing um, that I think it calls to mind is the relationship between writing and speaking. Right? And this is something that uh, Arso Ferret has already raised in her mention of the fact that uh, there are such things as a kri and ktiv, a word that's written one way and pronounced another. Uh, What's interesting about the Kree and Ketiv, and there are many examples of them, some of them are quite fascinating, uh, is that it insists, I think, uh, upon both the independence and the interdependence of the Torah that is written and the Torah that is spoken. All right? uh, interdependence in the sense that they both require the other. Uh, you cannot have Torah reading, obviously, without assembly, without speech. If I get up to read the Torah in a synagogue and I get up there and I look at the text and I go, mm-hmm, got it. Uh, no one has fulfilled his or her obligation and I assume people will be on other grounds annoyed and d disappointed. Uh, uh, it, it, it requires assembly and it requires a speech act. And if I read it, pronounce it incorrectly, that's not acceptable and nor is it a valid excuse to say, I just misspoke. You know what I meant, right? Um, uh, no, the problem is not that I misunderstood it. The problem is precisely that I misspoke it. But uh, it is also the case that the, the Torah must be written in a certain way. Right? I can't use uh, a, a printed book. I cannot use 
though I frequently, frequently I've several times encountered uh, texts that have mistakes in them, that, that, dis that vitiates the process, that, that, that nullifies the reading. So these two things that depend on, on each other, but they're sort of, they're sort of independent in the sense that um, uh, we are intent on preserving both the uh, written text in complete fidelity to other written texts, as, the, as, as Julie Seltzer said, that's why you can't do it from memory. Right? Uh, it has to be an unbroken chain of copying of, of writing. Uh, but we also preserve the integrity uh, of the precise vocalized text. It's not okay for me to read the, uh, a, a word. In fact, there are a couple examples of words that are not just a letter or a letter missing, a letter, a, a totally different word. Right? A different word for hemorrhoids, if you're curious. Uh, um, I cannot read the, the word for hemorrhoids as it appears in the text and use as my excuse that's the way it's written. Right? Nor is uh, Julie Seltzer free to uh, inscribe the word for hemorrhoids that I will read uh, next summer um, uh, on the excuse, well, I know, I know how they're going to read it anyway. No, we insist on, on preserving both of them, making them both essential in some way to, 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 to the other, uh, 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 and also insisting upon their difference. Right? We insist upon the fact that the writing and the speech have to be different, the same time that we insist upon the fact that, 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 they, that they support each other. And this is, this is interesting, I think it's interesting practically, um, uh, but to, to, uh, to touch upon something that, that, that Julie Seltzer raised, um, uh, it does, uh, it, it does, I think, prompt larger questions about the relationship between writing and speech in the tradition. The black fire and white fire, uh, to, to which uh, uh, to which this this affair um, re referred, is also often has been understood mystically as the relationship between the Torah as something that was originally written or the Torah as something that's originally spoken. Uh, and to me, that's a just fascinating intellectual question. Ordinarily, we in not in Jewish life, but just in life, and especially in the history of Western thought, we tend to think that speech comes first. Uh, often the way in which we show our sophisticated superiority uh, over the Jewish tradition is to say, of course, these things were originally oral traditions, right? Everything was first spoken, and then they get written down. We think of the scribe uh, as transcribing that which is spoken, and we usually think that something is lost in the process. Uh, the ritual of, this, of, 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 of the sofer um, and of the inscription of a Torah uh, would seem to reverse that. The writing actually comes first, right? Uh, and the speech, although it's necessary, is, is, uh, uh, is uh, an attempt, you might even say like a, a, a valiant and perhaps unsuccessful attempt to capture that which is original in the writing, right? So uh, there are ways in which, which the, the, the rituals that this exhibit is, is, uh, is, is showcasing, I think gives us some ways of thinking about, about how often in, in life, in, uh, in uh, modern culture, traditional culture, in the history of, of, uh, of, of Western thought, um, uh, writing does have, have, have a primacy. But, but at the end of the day, uh, um, for anyone who lives within a culture of the writing and, and the, the reading of the Torah, although there's a, a tremendous asymmetry between the two, the private writing, the public reading, the very slow, laborious process of writing, the very quick and often uh, frenetic process of, 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 of reading the Torah. Uh, uh, despite that asymmetry, they, 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 they very much um, uh, are, 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 are linked in interdependent uh, and, uh, and preconditions for, for, for the other. The final thing I want to say is that what they really share then, uh, and this exhibit is, is, I think, a great opportunity to think about that, uh, is that they're also both performative. We tend to think of, of speech as performative, um, and Torah reading is performative, both technically and ideally it's performative in, in, in the ordinary sense. It's a great story, and when you read Torah, you get to, to, um, you get to speak in the voice of all kinds of characters, not just Moses and Abraham and Sarah, but also a serpent and a, and a donkey, uh, a god, uh, and the best character of all, uh, if... Uh, if you have the privilege of reading Torah, uh, you will notice the most fun character to read is actually the character of, of the narrator. Uh, the, the, the narrator is a really interesting character, and having to impersonate the voice of the, of the narrator is a, is a performative challenge. But what this exhibit is doing is it's showing you also the performative possibilities of being a scribe, which I know nothing about. I'm not, I'm not a scribe, and I've never watched anyone 
uh, uh, write more than a couple letters um, of, 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 of a sacred text. But to, uh, I, I know that you've been uh, all enjoined to, 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 to let the Soferet write, uh, which I think implies to leave her alone. But obviously, it's not what you're supposed to do in this exhibit. What you're really supposed to do is watch her perform her, her art. Uh, so that's, that's what I want to say. And then we'll talk about this later. So I thought I would start with a song that really just speaks about the Torah and how it gives, gives light to us. So if you know this, you can sing along, please. Yisrael, Yisrael ve'oraita Yisrael ve'oraita the Shabbatrichu, Harhu, Yisrael, Yisrael, the Kudu Shabbatrichu, Harhu, Yisrael, Yisrael, the Kudu Shabbatrichu, Harhu, Yisrael, Yisrael, the Kudu Shabbatrichu, Harhu, Torah, Torah, Hallelujah, Torah, Torah. Israel, we could have Israel, Israel, we could have had Israel, we could have Israel, Israel, we could have had If you've ever chanted Torah or looked inside a Torah, as both Julie and David mentioned, there's no vowels, there's no trope. And it's often very challenging to remember what the words are because you're obligated to read it correctly. So the trope is a tool for us to remember. So it's also a tool to teach Torah stories through music. The music sits in a different part of our brain. So if, for example, if someone asks you to recite the words of the Star Spangled Banner, you'd start singing it in your head. So we have a special part of our brain that stores music and it helps us remember words to things. Same reason why we learn the alphabet through music. So I'm gonna play you two, uh, two Torah stories through song. Great way to teach kids about the Parsha, but also a great way for us to remember particular details that we wouldn't otherwise remember about a Parsha. First day, day and night. And 
it was good First day, day and night Second day, heaven and earth And it was good First day Day and night Second day Heaven and earth Third day Plants and trees And it was First day, day and night Second day, heaven and earth Third day, plants and trees Fourth day, sun and moon and stars And it was good First day, day and night Second day, heaven and earth Third day, plants and trees Fourth day, sun and moon and stars Fifth day and wings and it was the first day day and night second day heaven and earth third day plants and trees fourth day and humankind and it was good first day day and night second day heaven and earth third day plants and trees fourth day and wings six day peace and humankind seventh day Shabbat rest and it was good and it was good That song was written by Peter and Ellen Allard, who are amazing contributors, contributors to the world of early childhood Jewish music and Jewish music beyond. They're incredible. And um, this next song I wrote. <laughs> so uh, you're going to hear a lot more about Godcast in just a minute. Um, but this is a song I wrote for the Godcast project about Parshat Kedoshim. Now, Parshat Kedoshim is a list of laws. So it was a little challenging to sort of come up with a creative way to present a list of laws as opposed to a story that has a lot of visual imagery and pictures. So you'll have to just listen. And uh, <laughs> it's, here we go. So if, if you want to check out the cartoon that goes with this, you'll have to... Go to the Godcast website, which Sarah will tell you all about in just a few minutes. In the chapters of 
love it a kiss the sacred words you shall not miss holy actions are the theme in parshat kiddoshim commandments you shall know indeed leave some harvest for those in need idols should be far away be sure to keep the sabbath day always welcome in the stranger take action if someone's in danger take care not to impede the blind do not wear cloth of threads combined it does no good to bear a grudge your duty to be a fair judge don't mix species of two kinds and do pay workers in good time don't sleep with the bride chosen for another man or you must offer up a ram. Please do not falsely swear and follow the rules when you trim your hair. Don't subject your daughter to prostitution. Don't solve disputes through retribution. Forbidden is a new tree's fruit and don't go after your neighbor's loot. Don't insult the deaf, although they cannot hear. Your mother and father you shall revere. Help another if you are able. No meat with blood at your table. God's sanctuary you shall venerate. With ghosts do not communicate. In ways of magic do not prophesize. Before your elders you must rise. On your skin, no tattoos, and love the body Hashem gave you. And some may say, above all else, love your neighbor as yourself. In the chapters of Leviticus, the sacred words you shall not miss. Holy actions are the theme in Parshat Kedoshim. Thank you. And if you're looking for a CD for kids, it's in the gift shop. Zoom golly golly. But we hate following Alana Jagoda. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Sarah. I'm Matthew. And um, we made the Godcast project together. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> thanks. So when we started Godcast, um, we, we, basically, if you don't know, um, we, every week, there's a different part of the Torah that Jews read, um, which we call the Parsha. And, um, and every week we made a different, we got a different really cool person or a really famous person or someone who's connected to the Parsha, sometimes all three, to, um, talk, about, to talk about it and then we animated it. And um, we're about to show you one of them. One of the biggest questions that we got wasn't like, how are you going to show like creation or how are you going to show like Abraham breaking the idols or, or like Moses crossing the Red Sea because you know, they're cartoons, we can show anything, but it was, um, it wasn't any of those. It was, how are you going to do the part of the Torah that tells in explicit and excruciating detail um, how to build the tabernacle? So we asked a furniture designer. Here he is. Reading Parsha Truma is like reading a furniture assembly manual in the original Swedish. It contains very technical instructions on how to construct God's sanctuary, and unless you took woodshop in elementary school, it can get confusing. The Parsha begins with the Jewish people encamped in the middle of the desert. Moses goes up Mount Sinai and God instructs Moses on a number of things. First, the Jewish people are to give gifts of gold, silver, exotic linens, and jewels. With those exotic materials, they are to build a holy sanctuary. And Moses stood there on Mount Sinai, 
And God instructed him further, saying, Some assembly required. So check out the overall layout. Build an ark of gold with two cherubs on top. Add a menorah, mini altar, and offering table all in gold. Place these in a house called a mishkan, a.k.a. divine dwelling place, a.k.a. tabernacle, out of wood and silver, and covered in expensive fabric. Zoom out to the sacrificial altar and utensils, all made in copper. Add a huge outer perimeter made of linen curtains between large wood posts. Now let's zoom in to the complicated part of this project, the Mishkan, a.k.a. dwelling place, a.k.a. tabernacle. Besides the pyramids, this is the most solid building the Jewish people have made in a while. And this building was going to have to be portable. And not portable like iPod portable, more like ten guys on either side lifting each piece on rods through the desert portable. To make a wall, they line up large planks of acacia wood and connect them with larger-than-life versions of those little wood pegs you use when assembling a bedroom set from Ikea or Target. But oops, we have a problem, because even though you've aligned the planks, they'll still move around like a slinky in the event of a sandstorm, earthquake, or any other unforeseen act of God, which, as we've seen, the Israelites are getting used to. To solve this, they push long rods through the entire wall, preventing this slinky effect. Now we've got everything aligned, but the planks can still pull apart, so each plank has tenons on the top and bottom. Tenons are basically wooden fingers extending from the ends of each plank. To secure one plank to the next, they place huge solid silver rings over adjoining tenons, locking them together. This technique not only makes for a secure wall, but also for a beautiful silver foundation and crown. And God said to Moses, Form follows function. Now that this ready-to-assemble dwelling place of the Lord is put together, zoom out. Inside, everything is gold, then silver, and then copper as you reach the outside. The Torah is not being very subtle with the symbolism here. The most precious thing the Jewish people have is God's presence. How do you house and keep the things that are most precious to you? In two weeks, the Torah flashes back to the story of the golden calf when the Israelites build an idol out of gold and precious jewelry. The Jewish people took many precious things with them out of Egypt, and the first thing they did with them was to build a false idol to worship. Does this mean that gold, jewels, and beautiful, luxurious things are evil? Not quite. In this Parsha, the Jewish people take those exact same materials and build an ark, a menorah, a mishkan. They use the very same materials to house and protect the deepest, most precious things we have. Just as the Israelites took many valuable things on their journey, during our lifetime, we also take with us many wonderful things, both physical and spiritual. It is up to us to decide how to treat what is most valuable. We have the choice to build either a golden calf or a mishkan. Rafi Kushik, right over there. Thank you. There's, there's actually, I think there's like six Godcast narrators in the room, and I'm just so happy they're all here and that they've all contributed. Um, it's pretty amazing, and we're really proud of all the Torah we've been able to make this year. Um, next week, or, or like Sunday, we're going to post our last episode. It's the completion of the Torah this weekend, Simchat Torah. So um, episode Vazot Habracha is live on our website right now, but come... Sunday, we're going to have a sheet again, and it's kind of a, a crazy thing, I think, for both Matthew and I, that it, this year is over, and so we all obviously invite you to come check it out. Um, At guidecast.com. <laughs> With a dash. G dash D. Um, so, so the inspiration for this project really, uh, uh, from my perspective at least, came from um, managing to grow up in a total Jewish vacuum. Um, in the southern U.S., where there was very little in the way of the great educational institutions and museums and things that you have in a place like San Francisco. Um, and it wasn't until my 20s when I moved myself to New York that I started getting interested in what is all this stuff and sitting down and trying to read the Torah on my own for the first time, which, especially when you look at a partial like Truma, is really hard. It's really hard to get into the text and you don't know what you're doing. So in a lot of ways, um, this project is about almost like being a, um, a Cliff's Notes or a gateway into 
being able to access um, what's a difficult text with if you don't have a teacher by your side, and we think that everyone should have a teacher by their side, but, um, but this is a way to help um, kids and adults get excited about the Parsha. Or stay excited about the Parsha. <laughs> um, I, I was always a nerd growing up. Um, I was one of those kids, like, I didn't actually take down our, like, King James version of the Bible, which was sitting on our um, bookcase where books sit, um, and read it. But I, I had, like, the Jewish child Bible stories and, like, stories of King Solomon on all of those, like, illustrated picture books that were kind of really cool and kind of, and, and like, kind of got me a little bit excited about the text, but never actually took me to the text. And, um, and that was an important step, but I was always like in my little bedroom, like when I came from home from school, reading, reading these picture books. And, and the idea that there were other people out there and that there was this whole conversation going on about like the Torah and what it means, not just to like the author of whatever book I was reading, but to a furniture designer who like might have different insights than I would into the construction of the tabernacle or, whoa, microphone. Um, so we, so, so that's what this project was really about. Just like you're all going to be passing by um, someone who's, who's having that vivid first person experience of writing, of write, writing the Torah. Um, we, we would, we would come up to, okay, the, in, in Parshat Pinchas, um, there's a story of the daughters of Tzalafchad. It's the, it, some people call it the big feminist chapter of the Torah, and some people call it the big. Is it a feminist chapter of the Torah? And um, we and we we called up um, a rapper named Hesta Prin. Um, she's one of the disciples of the Beastie Boys, and she's like our age, and she's really good. Um, and her real name is Julie Potash, of course. But and and she had a bat mitzvah, but she'd never like gone into the Torah after that. So we sat down on the phone and like learned about the daughters of Tzalafchad. And that's number 40 if you're on the website. So anyway, if, if you do know, especially a young person, maybe especially a young person who's having a bar bat mitzvah, who's looking for a way to, what is there to say about Parsha Nitzavim? That was my bat mitzvah Parsha. I, I can't get in, choose life, blessing and curse. How am I going to say something interesting about that? Um, I, I hope we have um, 55 interesting people um, to jog your brain. Um, and so just to, um, I guess to wrap up, we have... Um, there's so many different people in the project. It was really hard to pick. Are we going to show you a piece by Hesta Prin? Are we going to show you a piece by Rabbi Lawrence Kushner? Are we going to show you or a Sarah piece Lefton. By, by Sarah Lefton, by Matthew Roth, by Alana Jagoda, by David Henkin? There were so many um, pieces we could show you, but we're going to show you a real crowd pleaser, which is one of our musical pieces. It's, um, it's Parshat Shmini, um, and it's kind of a musical in two acts. So if you don't like the first half, you'll probably like the second half, and we hope you learn something. Um, and thanks for having us here. Thanks. Aaron, Aaron, newly made a high priest, brings an offering, offering a sacrificial feast and a atonement. For all his people's sins, Aaron set aflame what he had brought And then they bowed and sang when they saw the, the holy fire rising up from the altar Lighting up the night, there were blessings From Aaron and from Moses, who supposes all was well But soon a tragedy befell the sons of Aaron Avi who and Nadav, they were bringing Offerings to God, but their fire The fire was too strange Maybe God had become angry by the wine in each their veins They are consumed by a fire bursting forth from the altar They fall dead upon the floor And their father is silent While his sons are dragged away But Moses warns him not to mourn Fear that God will become angry And all of them will feel God's scorn And then God said to Aaron Tell you two surviving sons Not to drink and then approach the Holy One There's a difference between the sacred and profane And now you recognize these things are not the same As the ceremony continued 
Aaron's remaining sons gave their offerings and further tragedies were avoided. With that unpleasantness behind them, God began to hand down the list of animals that were allowed or forbidden to eat. He began with land animals. Any land animal that has cleft hooves and chews its cud, you can eat it. Some examples of animals no good for Jewish mandibles. Camels, rabbits, hares, pigs. Water animals. Any water animal, as long as it's got fins and scales, you can eat it. Some examples of animals no good for Jewish mandibles. Crab, shrimp, squid, octopus. Bird animals. Generally speaking, if it ain't a bird of prey, you can eat it. Some examples of animals no good for Jewish mandibles. Eagles, vultures, kites, falcons, ravens, ostrich, seagulls, hawks, owls, pelicans, storks, herons, hoopoes, bats. Bug animals. Now most bugs are forbidden. There's a couple that you can eat. I ain't sure which ones. Some kind of locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. Do you really want to eat bugs? Other animals. Things that creep around on the ground. Don't eat it. Some examples of animals no good for Jewish mandibles. Moles, mice, lizards, crocodiles, and chameleons. And then God said, You shall not make yourselves unclean by eating any of these things for i am the lord your god you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy for holy am i That was cool. Um, a couple of questions to start things off, and I'm hoping you'll have a chance to talk and ask each other questions, then we'll um, ask for questions in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, when I was up in the gallery earlier today, I was struck by, on one, on one side of the, of the floor, there was um, uh, a Torah. And um, it was under glass. and. Uh, it was something to uh, look at and to study, um, but was formal and important. Um, and then I turned around and I saw there was some parchment um, on the other wall, and it said, please touch. And I was struck by how the two things kind of um, were connected in some way, how you have one way we think about the Torah as being kind of forbidding and austere and so forth. On the other hand, we, we want to draw close to it and have a kind of a sense of intimacy with it, especially when we write it and when we read it. So um, I thought about this just for, for Julie and for David, but anybody can answer. What, how do those two things come together, the sense of intimacy, but also the sense of it being this thing out here? Um. Tell you what uh, I think of it. Uh, I actually don't think that they're so different. Um, I think of the taboos surrounding certain forms of touching the Torah uh, as not about it being forbidding. We do touch the Torah, we do draw close to it, we draw close to it in all kinds of uh, specially regulated ways. It's more that it's uh, fragile. Um, um, I, mean, I don't mean that literally. I, hopefully they're not super fragile, but uh, we, we act around them as if they are extraordinarily fragile and vulnerable. Uh, I don't actually think that's so at odds with the idea of having intimate relationship to it. Most objects that we have intimate relationships to, we tend to think of as fragile and vulnerable and tend to impose all kinds of taboos on, on the ways in which we touch them. But. 
I'm, I'm getting a signal that maybe we need to hold the microphones a little closer. Just um, housekeeping. Housekeeping. Um, I have a more, I guess, a less literal um, answer to that question because I, I live in the middle of a, of a community of a bunch of people that look a lot more like me than anyone else on the stage. Um, I, I live in Brooklyn, and um, and I kind of come from this Hasidic outlook, and or I live in the middle of it right now. And a lot of people, when I told them, "Yeah, we're going to make cartoons about the Torah and have like different people talk about them," they were like, "How can you have people who've never seen a Torah portion before talk about a Torah portion?" And and it was scary. And like I I knew that I was going to be in situations where people were going to be not just touching them, but like wrapping themselves inside a Torah. Um, and I guess I'm fortunate, like I live, I, my wife's family is Chabad, and they're all about um, not literally taking Torahs and throwing them into a mosh pit, but, but kind of figuratively that, that once I frame it in, the, in, in, this, in this kind of context of it's these people who've never seen a Torah portion before that are going to be talking about it, they're also going to be learning about it and like interacting with it and maybe carrying some of that home with them. I mean, we hope not in a, not necessarily in a like, they're going to separate all of their wool and linen clothes. Although that was an awesome line in the song. But like, you know, they're gonna take these stories and, and spread these stories and they're gonna take these like ideas and stuff that have framed our people and like our lives and, and like make them frame it in different ways and new ways. Um, and I don't know if that's like the most officially kosher thing that I can say, but damn it, I have like my favorite song that gets stuck in my head every time something really good happens. And, and I kind of have a vision of like the Torah being that for people or stories from the Torah being that. I don't think I've ever heard Torah and the mosh pit being used in the same sentence, which is, <laughs> which is great. Um, any other thoughts on that question? Or you can answer a question you would have liked me to ask. Um, I was going to uh, ask uh, uh, Alana about um, working with kids, and uh, like I have young kids, and uh, the younger ones at a Jewish preschool, and they go in the morning and they they see the Torah and they sing to it, and um, you know, adults by and large don't have that same sense of just kind of being able to draw close to it. And I'm wondering, working with kids, both with the text and also with music, whether that feels different than it does with adults. Um, definitely. I mean the. The song about Genesis, it was originally written as a children's song, but I think that rem remembering that it really speaks to adults as well. Um, and I really try to focus on creating family music. While I, it might be geared towards kids, it's really important for me to speak to adults because you're really engaging with families as a whole. Um, and there's just so much value in creating songs that teach and engage in a way that the text might just not be accessible in the same way. So in a way to simplify it, in a way you're presenting it to kids and then maybe present it to adults, and they're gonna know that that's simplified, but to be able to engage with it on a deeper level. So it's really sort of creating a colorful picture that's accessible and then being able, able to dive into the text on a different level with whichever audience you're engaging with. Um, I want to go back to the Torah mosh pit thing for a second. Um, uh, Julie, correct me if I'm uh, mistaken, but when uh, before you start the project of, or a, a scribe starts a project, you say, I am writing this for the sake of the sanctity of the Torah. Um, and yet, um, not and yet, but uh, connected to that, you have kind of the sensibility of God cast, which is, um, you know, a little mosh pit-ish, I guess. And there's this interesting... Um, juxtaposition between like the holy and the sanctified and the fun and the interesting and the reverent and so forth. And so I guess for, maybe for Sarah, I guess this is a question for Sarah. It started with Julie, but now it's going to Sarah. Um, how, how did you think about those two things coming together? And was it always, uh, did you always have a sense that the texture of it was going to be about those two things being together in some interesting conversation, those two sensibilities? Right. Um, first of all, we did show you a quirky selection. I could have showed you Parshat Shof team, where um, Rabbi David Saperstein um, from the Rack um, in Washington 
gives a pretty fiery, almost like classic pulpit social justice exhortation, right? And it was actually our most popular episode of the year. So there, like I could have showed you something very different and less irreverent, but at the end of the day, we're making cartoons. Um, and at the end of the day, like I come out of media, Matthew writes very funny um, young adult novels. Um, and it's our sensibility and we're all over it. Um, it also happens to um, seem to really work. We, um, you know, if, if our goal is to raise basic Jewish literacy, which is what it is, um, then we decided, um, A, we're good at it, and B, we, we want to take our cues from what's going on in contemporary media. What are kids watching on YouTube? What are kids passing around on their phones? What is going to snap a bored 13-year-old out of her seat in Sunday school class? And this seemed to be it. Now, we do um, walk a really careful line when you, know, when you talk about irreverence, and, um, and Matthew and I... Um, work very closely with each of the, um, you know, we don't write these pieces. Each week we have a guest writer narrator who writes them and Matt and I are very involved in making sure things don't cross the line and we do have certain rules about what does and doesn't fly um, in these episodes. Um, and But we really invite humor, we really invite um, quirky outlooks and weird perspectives, but at the end of the day, we don't mess with the story and we don't say anything that's not there and we don't, um, leave out important stuff that is there. Like, we're not going to hide from some of the uncomfortable things that come up in Leviticus. And, you know, we invite you to watch all of those episodes of, in Leviticus and see how we handle touchy stuff. Because we, we tried to be funny, but also to be to be pretty reverent, actually. I, I just want to say that I think it's a mistake to exaggerate the difference between Godcast and the Bible on grounds of reverence. One could easily make the case that, that uh, obviously people approach Godcast with uh, uh, maybe not with less reverence, but with with fewer taboos uh, than the Bible. But um, one can make the case that Godcast is is actually much more homiletic. It's more likely to exhort people to to change their lives. More likely to insist upon the meaning of its own text uh, than the Bible, uh, which isn't. Uh, the um, it, it's it's true that that the, the Godcast doesn't doesn't censor the Bible, but uh, uh, there's a way in which the Bible is far more likely to parody itself um, and to uh, uh, to, I think, uh, resist attempts to find meaning in it, then God cast is to do that to the Bible. Huh. It's, a pretty, it's, on. Yeah. Yeah. it's a pretty irreverent text, I think, the Torah itself. <laughs> um, and forget about 13-year-olds. I mean, I think adults want to laugh and want to have fun with Torah. I don't, I don't see any contradiction between something like God cast and and the Torah. And, um, I, I kind of have my own little Torah mosh pit also, in addition to the standard Torah, which is that I bake challah in the shape of something from the week's Parsha right. every week. That's so cool. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, the sacrificial, and I'm not sure if it was specifically that Parsha, but uh, a sacrificial animal, and, and I baked a beet inside of the, the neck so that when we sliced it <laughs> for mozi, <laughs> What did you do this week? <laughs> this week will be Eshdat. It'll be a burnt challah. You, you, she's got them all on a website somewhere, and I've seen it, and it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, I, maybe this is a good time just to add that uh, Julie will be doing a series of baking um, workshops, or I, I don't know what to call them, Torah baking workshop conversation, <laughs> mosh pit, burnt challah things. So... Check, check our website soon. I think it's starting at the, the end of the year. Um, I, I think I'd like to get off the bima here and uh, see if people have any questions. I'll, maybe I'll come around with this microphone. Would the Orthodox have any objection for a woman to write the Torah? Are you asking me? Yes. <laughs> How many questions did you think it was going to take till you got that one? <laughs> I think the Vegas was plus or minus a half. Um, in, in the halachic literature, uh, specifically sort of the Bible for scribes, which is Keset Asofer, the, the scribe's inkwell, the very first rule is the following people, if they write a Torah, it will be invalid. And women are on that list. Now, there is a difference between something being 
invalid after it's written and it being not permissible for someone to do. I think, that's how I think of it. I, I haven't, I've encountered a lot of surprise when I go to Israel and people ask me what I do and I say, Safrut, they think I, I'm saying, that's scribing, they think I'm, they say, oh, Sifrut, literature you're studying? And then I say it again and they still, they're like, what? But you're a woman. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of surprise. I haven't encountered any um, animosity personally. It doesn't mean that everybody would use a Torah that I wrote. And Orthodox congregations would not use a Torah that I wrote, as far as I know. The other question I had was, when you do write a Torah, do you have somebody sort of over, looking over your shoulder to make sure that three quarters of the way to, uh, through the Torah you haven't made a mistake, that the whole thing has to be uh, buried uh, in the ground? I guess that's the way they do it. Well... I'm ch I'm checking as I go that I'm not make that I'm not making mistakes. But if I make a mistake, then I mark it on a photocopy of a of a book that I'm following, and I go back and I fix the mistake afterwards. And there's also proofreaders that will come and read each panel, each word, and they'll also be checking. And finally, there will be hopefully a computer check. There's a program where you can scan a Torah. You can also scan old Torahs. And the computer will actually generate a list for you of all the mistakes, and it will break it down by type of mistake. So you can then go back and is, fix is it. Is it Torah considered kosher if you, if you go over the mistake itself? You have to lift off a piece of the, of a layer of the parchment uh -huh. and, re, and rewrite it. it. It gets more complicated if it's one of God's names. But other than that, yeah, you can go back and fix mistakes. Something that I'm curious about. What about the calligraphy, the choice of fonts? Is there any freedom in that over the generations? Or do you have to copy that also from the old scrolls? Are you asking me? <laughs> who, who should I ask? Um, there are a few different scripts that are used, though there are different... Um, there have been different styles of writing, and this is what scholars use to determine where a Torah came from, so what area and what time period. I think often they look at the script. But there are standard scripts. Um, I'll be using the script of um, the Arizal, um, which is maybe more of a, a Kabbalistic type of script. It's, it's very sim similar to the most popular script, which is the, the Beit Yosef, um, with some slight differences. So. Anybody have a... I just wanted to, um, uh, even within a script, there's, I say this because the, at the Mission Minion we recently um, uh, commissioned the, uh, the writing of a Torah, and we were looking entirely at Beit Yosef, Beit Yosef scripts, uh, but I had uh, 40 photocopies of different scribes' work. So I, I, and it was pretty different. I mean, it's right to call it one script, uh, but uh, you definitely, I don't know if you, if you, I wouldn't say you see the personality of the Sofer uh, in the script. I mean, at least I can't. But uh, uh, you definitely see variations. You see, uh, uh, you, you, see, you see their training. You see their skill. Um, so there's a... It's 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 not like a printing press. It, it, there is a, a remarkable amount of individuality to to uh, the calligraphy in a Sefer Torah. Time for a couple more questions. Hi, we're all picking on you tonight, Julie. <laughs> there was mention of these guidelines on the top of the line. I have never seen them in a Torah before. I. The Torah that's on display upstairs, if you look, you see faint indentations sometimes, but not throughout the whole scroll. And I've never seen it before. And you refer to it in your film, and it's also annotated upstairs. Is that in every Torah? It actually is. 
in every Torah. It, possibly the one on display, the lines have faded just because of the age of the Torah. But I also didn't know there were score lines until I started learning this art. And then the next time I went to read Torah, to chant Torah, I looked and I said, oh, oh, there they are. It's amazing. You can't really, it's not, it's not um, pencil. It's, 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 uh, it's, in, it's slight indentation. And it's actually required. A top, a top line is required. Even if the scribe can write in a straight line, it still has to be scored. And there's a line that delineates the columns, exactly. The good thing about Julie being here for a year, <laughs> that you'll have plenty of time to come and see her work and ask questions. Um, we have time for one more question. I don't know what it is about this area. <laughs> good students. It's a question to Matthew and Sarah. Have you thought about uh, translating Godcast.com to Hebrew um, to pr reproduce it in Hebrew? I just think of all the kids, adults, and people like myself and my friends in Israel who would really enjoy it. Um, so, so we're on it, in fact. Um, I, I was in Noah's office, that's Noah, from the Israel Center, and I was in her office just yesterday um, schmoozing with two different people who are interested in helping me with this project. We want to translate all of the work into not only Hebrew, um, but uh, Russian and Spanish as well. And I have, um, everyone cross your fingers with me together and sparkle fairy dust. I have a grant out to get that done, actually. Um, we've, you know, transcribed all of the cartoons already. I have a database of all the transcriptions. And um, it's just a matter of, I ha I've been doing some homework and I found some software and we're just going to do it line by line and we need to have Hebrew, Russian, and Spanish speakers just go in and do those lines and it's going to put subtitles up on the cartoons. So that's something we'd really like to do in the next few months. So if you have any rich uncles, just put them in touch and uh, we'll get it done. Yes. Yes, very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for speaking and for coming.